Hearing this, his family was greatly amazed, not because they believed what he said to them was true, but because they thought that he was losing his mind. Brothers and sisters, when you talk about the gospel in the true way that Christ preaches the gospel, the way that John Bunyan preached the gospel, the way that Elijah set forth and Moses before him, when you preach the gospel in that way, people think that you're losing your mind or that at least you're well too tight. Mm -hmm. So as the evening approached, hoping that sleep might settle his mind, they quickly put him to bed. But the night was as troublesome to him as the day. Instead of sleeping, he spent the night in sighs and tears. So when morning came, his family came to find out how he was doing. Worse and worse, he told them. And he begins to plead with them again. Well, we'll come back to that when we get to chapter 1 next week. But that's how it starts. It doesn't start once upon a time. There was a man. And he loved his family very much. And he thought, well, you know, we can just begin to mosey down this path of life. No, he's, he's powerfully convicted that he's going to stand before God and he pleads with his family. And we're going to see that in the very beginning of chapter 1, his family will not come with him. One of the most amazing things about the book is that his family never comes with him. His family never comes with him. Now, some of you are ahead of me and you think, wait a minute, I, I read it and his family does come with him. No, in the book that we have, his family never comes with him. And that is the book that he published in 1678. But eight years later, just two years before his death, there was such a pressure upon him to write a follow-up. And he did. And Christiana is the follow-up. Uh, and his wife does um, follow. Not, not with him, but follows later. Um, uh, eight years later, he wrote a follow-up book to her. Why do I make that point? Because when he wrote this book, he was very aware of the cost. He was very aware that if any man loves his mother or his brother or his wife or his children more than me, he cannot be my disciple, the Bible says. And so once again, we find that John Bunyan is remarkably accurate to the Bible. Remarkably accurate to the Bible. And he, he, we see this idea of genuine wrestling. Christian is wrestling. How does he begin addressing his children and his family? He says, dear family. And he pleads with them. He wants them to come with him. But they won't come with him. But he won't lag behind. He won't lag behind. What are those beautiful words in John Angel James' book, A Christian Father's Present to His Children? You all know them. What does he say to his children in that last chapter? <clears throat> Somebody tell Children, me. make every effort to join us in heaven. Your mother and I will be there. That's what he says. That's what he says to them. From that beginning to the end of that book, he pleads with his children to come to Christ, to live for Christ, come to Christ. In the last chapter, the blessed occasion of the joyful reunion of a pious family in heaven, he says, we have done everything we can, and we're going to be in heaven. You make every effort to join us. I can't think of better words for parents to say to their children. You better know you're going to be in heaven before you do. <laughs> but if you know you're going to be in heaven, if you know that you are saved and united to Christ by faith and the graces of a Christian life, if you know that you have a true and lively faith, then say to your children, your mother and I will be in heaven. Make every effort to join us. And that's what John Bunyan does through this book. It is a remarkable, remarkable book. Unrealistic expectations always lead to disappointment. If you want to play tennis without a net, if the net bothers you, then you don't like tennis. And if challenges bother you about Christianity, you don't like Christianity. Listen to that again. If challenges and afflictions and sufferings bother you, then you don't like. Every vine that bears fruit, I prune that it might bear more fruit. Christians love God and love the ways of God. And so as they are navigating down the path, as they're, as they're making their way down the path, challenges come to them. Challenges come. But it isn't let's turn back. It isn't let's redefine God. It's crying out to God for deliverance. Crying out to God for wisdom and for great grace and for great heart and for help along the way, but not turning back and not compromising God and rewriting the Bible and rewriting the Scriptures or creating a new God. 
but submitting to this God, the one true God. Joining God in his God-centeredness. Well, we need to know something tonight about the times. Uh, gosh, I, I just need to give you a history lesson. That's all there is to it. Um, we need to know something about the times. Somebody tell me when the Reformation started as we think of it. 1517. 1517 is when the Reformation started. October 31st, Luther posted the 95 Theses, and radical things come as a result of that. And the gospel is rediscovered. But it's a remarkably turbulent time. It's a remarkably turbulent time. In England, Henry VIII is uh, king. And as you recall, he is uh, married uh, to Catherine of Aragon, and she has given him several children, including three sons, where they all died as children. And uh, so she has no male heir for him. And so his desire is a male heir. He wants to establish the Tudor dynasty. And so he divorces her, as you recall, and marries Anne Boleyn. But he has a child with her, with uh, his first wife, and her name is Mary. And then with Anne Boleyn, who he later executes, he has another child, whose name is Elizabeth. And then later, uh, with Catherine Parr, his last wife, who fortunately now lives him, uh, he has a uh, son named Edward. Henry VIII dies in uh, 1547. 1547 is when Henry VIII dies. And Mary comes to the throne. Henry VIII has brought England into the Reformation, uh, largely because he wants to sever his relationships with Rome, not because he's particularly religious. But Protestantism comes into <laughs> England as a result. And it becomes a haven for Protestantism in Europe uh, during Henry VIII's time. But he dies, and when he dies, Mary, his daughter, who is the, his uh, mother was Aragon, remember? Catherine of Aragon. Um, she wants to restore it to Roman Catholicism, and she does. So from 1547 until 1553, so when she dies, short reign, six years, she executes 300 people in England in her lifetime. Now, this book is published in 1678, and he was born in 1628. Okay, so that gives us some context here as to what's going on. But great havoc is everywhere in England, uh, going back and forth. And Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558 and rules till 1603, and England becomes solidly Protestant, solidly Protestant under her long reign. Um, uh, I left out Edward here. Edward has a short reign. I'm sorry. Uh, Edward has a short reign. She's 1553 to 1558. Edward is 47 to 53, the son. Uh, he's only 15 years old uh, when he dies. Uh, so he dies in 1553. And Edward keeps it Protestant. Um, but Mary takes it back Catholic, and then it comes back Protestant again. So the great turmoil going back and forth here. If you recall, Elizabeth dies, and after Elizabeth dies, there's no heir. She's the virgin queen. There's no heir. And so they go to uh, Scotland, <coughs> and they take James the Sixth of Scotland. They bring him down and make him James the First of England. And he becomes king. This is significant. James I, in that following with these other kings, has something that we now, to, no one does today virtually, at least not in Europe. He has the concept of the divine right of kings. He has the concept of the divine right of kings. And what does that mean? That's a real question. What does that mean? <laughs> And therefore, God gave him the power, therefore, He's going to use it. everything he does is right. Everything he does is right. He has the idea that everything he does is right. Rex Lex, the king is law. Rex Lex, the king is law. Well, he has a son named Charles I. And Charles I comes into the world believing in the divine right of kings and is a tyrant. And the parliament rejects him, sends him away. He comes back. They send him away, he comes back, they execute him. They execute him in 1649. In 1649, he's executed. Now look at the time frame here. In 1649, he's executed, and Oliver Cromwell becomes the Lord Protector of England. And the Puritans are now the, uh, the dominant party in Parliament. The Puritans got their name... <coughs> It's a, um, it's a pejorative style. It's not an honorary thing. It's a put-down. It's an insult. Um, the Puritans get their name 
because they rejected the idea of playing sports on the Lord's Day. Um, and they, they just recognized that's just not appropriate. It's, it's, it's a violation of the Fourth Commandment. Um, but the Episcopalians, the dominant church before them, the Episcopalians uh, thought that was a great idea, and that wouldn't surprise anybody. Um, so that split them in terms of the how, how carefully do we follow the ways of God. And these people wanted to follow carefully the ways of God and became known as Puritans. Well, Cromwell is one of them. They execute the king in 1649. If you remember, Oliver Cromwell reigns uh, in his place virtually. Oliver Cromwell has a son named Richard who replaces him as Lord Protector. But Richard Cromwell has no interest in any of this. So Richard Cromwell, in 1660, steps down from being Lord Protector and says, bring the monarchy back. And they go to Charles I's son and court him back from France. And they bring him back and they restore the monarchy uh, with Charles II. When Charles II comes back, he remembers who executed his parents, his father. Not his parents, his father. The Puritans did. The Puritans who dominated Parliament were responsible for it, and so he immediately moves in such a way to do everything away from the Puritans and embrace the Episcopal form of government. The Episcopal form of government is the idea not that churches run themselves and have elders and that type of thing, but that there is an archbishop and bishops and, and that type of thing, all appointed by the government, uh, all appointed by a head, head down kind of idea. Well, that's kind of some background here. You see, 1660, that's the very year that... Um, uh, John Bunyan is put in prison uh, the first time because he's preaching without a license. And that's what Charles II does. The first thing he comes when he comes to the throne, anybody who tries to preach outside of the Episcopal Church is an outlaw. And that's, and that's what he does. In 1662, he goes further and he makes all of the Episcopal preachers uh, swear that they will only use the prayer book and begins to narrow their idea. And about 2,000 preachers left their pulpits uh, August 23rd, 1662. And that's, the, uh, and that's the starting of what we now call sort of English Protestantism. English, uh, it, it's these people you recognize. When, when, when does a Mayflower come to America? 1620. 1620. When is Jamestown, Virginia? 1607. 1607 uh, gives you an idea. When they leave their pulpits in 1662, America begins to look really good. Um, <laughs> And so we get, we, get, we get the rich inheritance of that. Well, that's kind of some background here to what's going on. A couple of the things you should be aware of is that um, the 30-year war took place. This is a very troubling time. The 30-year war took place in uh, Europe and ends in 1648. And it is literally a 30-year war, 1618 to 1648. For 30 years, the mainland of Europe is just ravaged back and forth by Protestantism versus Catholicism. Uh, mostly what we call today German, Germany, but it's Germany, France, uh, Sweden, Denmark are heavily involved in it. Poland ravage, and as they're ravaged, the Black Plague just breaks out everywhere because wherever there's warfare, the Black Plague shows up right after that. And so death is everywhere. In John Bunyan's lifetime, death is everywhere. Every time you go to church, what do you see? When you enter the door, what do you see? The judgment seat of Christ. Every time you go, you see the judgment You walk under the judgment seat of Christ to come into the church. And everywhere you turn in his day, death is everywhere. Well, they threw the Puritans out in 1662. In 1665, the bubonic plague broke out in London in a major way. Just three years later, all the Puritans, of course, said, literally, this is because of what God has done. God is doing this. The plague breaks out, and over 100,000 people die in London. Now look at the time frame again. The book isn't published until 1678. 1665, the Black Plague breaks out in London. And in 1666, God spares them by having the city burn to the ground. And London burns to the ground. They have a great fire of London in 1666.